So good morning. Uh, my name is Dave Nellist. I'm the uh, national chair of the Trade Unionist and Socialist uh, Coalition and the chair of uh, today's conference. I just want to make a couple of uh, uh, brief opening political points and then some organisational things and then introduce and welcome our uh, panel speakers to start the, uh, the conference. And as I'm sure uh, all comrades uh, don't need telling, uh, we, we're meeting at today's conference at a pivotal political moment. We've got the background of a decade of austerity with wages stagnated and fallen. The nurses 15% pay campaign is um, an illustration of the depth of that uh, fall. We've lost whole swathes of essential local services from libraries to youth clubs from nurseries to community centres and a quarter of a million council jobs that provided those essential services. And now after a year of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're under a Tory government responsible for the worst death rate in Europe and the worst hit economy of any of the main capitalist uh, countries. And if the Tories get away with it, they intend to overlay even more as a clawback for the borrowing and the guarantees of around £400 billion they've so far spent to safeguard the interests of big business uh, with wage freezes, pension and benefit cuts and even more cuts in council services. So it's clear we need a mass campaign of resistance, of fighting cuts, of supporting the strikes, particularly of those who are fighting cuts and not letting the May elections just be a debate between different wings of the establishment. Because if there's nobody in May challenging why austerity should continue, it's just going to be a debate between establishment parties on how austerity should be imposed. So today uh, we're going to discuss the challenge at the May elections and the standing as widely as we are able with anti-austerity candidates on May the 6th and we want you to get involved and to stand as a candidate. Conference will begin today with five 10-minute uh, contributions. Firstly four introductions from representatives of the component parts of the Tusk Steering Committee from the uh, Transport Union, the RMT, from the Socialist Party, from the individual members and from Resist, the Movement for a People's Party. Then Clive Heemskirk, who's the national agent, will outline the local election manifesto, which if you haven't read uh, it already, is available on the homepage of our website at uh, www.tusk.org.uk, but I'm sure uh, the technical team will put a link uh, in the chat to that uh, if they haven't done um, already. We're then going to have time for about 20 three-minute contributions and, and there are three uh, I think tabled uh, amendments which will be taken in that uh, uh, session. Again I hope you've uh, seen them but I'll read those amendments out before they are moved. We won't actually be taking votes today on those individual amendments but the steering committee which meets on the 24th of February uh, to finalise the election uh, platform for May the 6th. We'll take the decisions on that platform, bearing in mind the points that the movers have made and of course any subsequent comments that are made in the discussion. Finally, at one o'clock, the five opening speakers will each have five minutes to, uh, to reply. Those of you who do speak uh, will get a sign from me. I haven't quite worked out what it's going to be yet, but anyway, a sign from me when you've got one minute left. Unfortunately, we can't let people overrun their allotted uh, time, so I'll have to be quite strict, and those that go beyond their time may find themselves muted. Now, Zoom enables us to come together and is therefore extremely valuable uh, in this lockdown, but it, it's not by no means perfect. This, unfortunately, is not a normal conference. We've got certain security uh, uh, measures in terms, like I say, of a waiting room of people being uh, uh, muted. We have that chat facility, but only to make points to me as chair and not for uh, wider discussion. So use it, for example, to let me know if you want to speak. And with well over 400 here now, 421 at latest uh, count, uh, I won't be able to see if you uh, raise uh, a hand or wave. But our technical team will be looking for that. So if you want to raise a virtual hand or send a message to the chair once the team of seen your uh, hand and written down your name, they'll lower your hand for you. 
Now, just to finish, we will be recording the, the conference because we want to put it out more widely, perhaps on YouTube uh, later, and we will keep a record of the chat. So if you do ask any questions that don't get answered today, um, then any and all points that are put in the chat, I'll make sure we answer to you in the next couple of days. Now, we did try and get Jackie Weaver as the technical uh, chair, but fortunately uh, she wasn't available. So we've got Lenny Shale and his team working, I must stress, with authority to keep the meeting running uh, smoothly. And uh, Lenny will put links in the, uh, the chat uh, for you to, uh, to see. As I say, already the agenda has been put up there, but also I think we're gonna have some links to merchandise uh, including Sheffield's uh, produced Tusk t-shirts. So one final point, um, there's lots of material on the Tusk website and on our Facebook page, not least the forthcoming launch meetings uh, in a number of areas in the rest of February and early uh, March. So can I just ask those of you who use social media to help us promote those meetings and the briefing papers we produce to as wide an audience as possible. And for today's uh, conference, please feel free to make comments on social uh, media. If you're using Twitter, perhaps the hashtag uh, Tusk21 might be uh, useful. And for those of you who are looking to see what others are saying, you can then search on Twitter for hashtag Tusk21 and uh, hopefully retweet those comments. So with all that, uh, once again, um, many thanks to all of those who have come this morning to the Tusk local elections uh, conference. And can we now have our first platform speaker, who's going to be Jared Wood, who's a, a National Executive Committee member of the RMT, uh, the founding organisation of Tusk some 11 years ago. Jared. Cheers, Dave. In 1899, a guy called James Holmes moved a resolution for the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants at the TUC and the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants or the ASRS, to save me keep saying that in full, was, uh, was a forerunner to the National Union of Railwaymen, which in turn became part of the RMT today. So we uh, in the RMT have a long history of engagement with this issue of, uh, of building a political force to represent the interests of working people and working class communities. James Holmes moved that, uh, that resolution and uh, it called for the TUC to make an appeal to all forces of the Labour movement to come together to establish a committee to ensure the more effective representation of working people in Parliament. The resolution was passed by from memory, about 540,000 votes, and I say by memory, I mean from what I've read, not so I wasn't there, 540,000 votes to 436,000 votes. Some, uh, some important sections of the working class, the miners, the cotton spinners, were sceptical. They voted against. They thought it was an impractical proposition to try and build a, a, a party of the, of the working class. They felt that it was better to continue supporting the Liberals at that time, but the resolution was passed. And then on the 26th, 27th of February, 1900, uh, in Farringdon, the first meeting of the uh, Labour Representation Committee was held and, uh, and agreed a, a resolution put forward by Keir Hardy and, the, uh, and a, a whole number of trade unions organised within the TUC, the Independent Labour Party, the Social Democratic Federation and the Fabians came together to establish that Labour Representation Committee. And of course, it wasn't a coincidence that, uh, that it happened at that time. It was uh, a time of developing bitter industrial struggles. The, A the ASRS were involved in 1900 in the Taff Vale Railway dispute, which, uh, which lasted uh, uh, just short of, of two weeks of strike action. People were thrown out of their homes for, uh, for, for striking. Picketing was banned by the courts, and uh, and most uh, most notably in historical terms, the uh, the uh, legal liability was established on a trade union to pay damages to an employer for profits lost as a result of industrial action, and the ASRS was fined the equivalent today of two and a half million pounds for hitting the profits of the of the Taff Bale Railway, and these were the the. the these court judgments and the, the absolutely naked and obvious class 
character of the law and uh, and politics that are causing the politicians who make those laws was uh, was exposed for all to see and gave a real drive to the process of forming uh, a working class party that, uh, that of course, the, uh, that was, was the aim of the resolution of the ASRS and that, that Labour Representation Committee. And today, of course, we face a situation where you could ask many of the same questions. What force in Parliament today is prepared to fight to free the trade unions? The Labour Party has a very limited programme there. They've said that they uh, that they would uh, reverse the legislation for minimum service levels, etc. But they stopped way short of, uh, of freeing our unions, of giving us back the right to picket and uh, and the, uh, the, the and the right to uh, to, to organise free of, uh, of of constraint from uh, from the law. What uh, what force in Parliament today is going to prevent the ruling elite from imposing the costs of the COVID crisis? onto the working class. The, the Liberal, Tory and, uh, and Labour axis over the past number of decades have allowed the, uh, the, the, the ruling elite in Britain, and of course you see it repeated across the world, but you see it in Britain, the ruling elite enriching themselves year after year at the expense of, uh, of working people and the rights of working people. Since the 2008 financial crisis, the richest thousand people in Britain doubled their wealth and then increased it by the same amount again in the in the in the 10 years after the crisis of 2008 and the forces in parliament today will be doing everything they can representatives as they are of big business including many in the labor party the labor party receives enormous funding now from uh, from big business <clears throat> to replace some of the reliance that that, part, that the party had on the trade unions in the in the past and, uh, <clears throat> and we have to ask the question, who will ensure going forwards that the social infrastructure in Britain is able to withstand another crisis of the kind of, uh, of COVID-19, <clears throat> excuse me, in the future? Who's going to ensure that we have a health service that's fit to withstand another pandemic? Of course, the pandemic is, uh, is, is an exceptional event, but not unforeseeable. It was foreseen when the when the government ran a uh, a, uh, a modelling exercise about uh, four years ago into what would happen in the event of a major pandemic of this kind. It revealed many of the problems that have now hit us, but they did nothing. They did nothing. The number of acute care beds in the NHS is about half the level it was 20 years ago. They they've opened Nightingale hospitals, but they have no staff to work in them. The, the crisis of COVID is largely a crisis of the health service, social care and public health. The, the local authorities have been decimated with the best will in the world, even if the state now takes the decision that it needs to intervene to, uh, to, to, to manage the COVID pandemic. They, in many cases, they don't have the mechanisms to do it because they've abolished them. Local authorities have become, uh, have become management companies to, to award contracts to, uh, to the private sector. Who is gonna reverse that? Who is going to reverse the policies on housing, on jobs, on casualisation of employment? What force in Parliament is going to do any of that today? And if there is no force in Parliament that's going to do any of that today, who, who, who on the left could possibly argue against a project to try and reverse that situation and build that force and, and do what the trade unions and socialists did in 1900 and bring together the forces who want to do that to try and make more effective that project and, uh, and, and to go forwards in that way. I believe it's no more realistic to expect Keir Starmer's Labour Party to, uh, to play that role now than it was to expect the Liberals to do it in 1900. I completely respect those who, who wish to fight the fight in the Labour Party, who feel that in the, in, in the immediate period after Corbyn's uh, uh, removal as leader, that perhaps there is still the possibility of, uh, of building those forces in the Labour Party. I, I, I have full respect for, for anyone that wants to do that, and, I, and, and I'll applaud any, any real efforts that are made in that direction. And if in the future we see a genuine left again in the Labour Party, then I would argue for any other forces of the left to unite with that, and to come together and to, and to you know, to, again, to use the language of 1900 to make more effective the political representation of the working class. But we can't, we cannot sit back and, uh, and wait 
for uh, for Labour to be reconquered by the left. It's a vanishingly small proposition, and we and we can't ignore we can't ignore not just 19th century or early 20th century history, but recent history. If we look across Europe, if we look around the world, social democratic parties, mass parties of the working class have not just been pushed into retreat like the British Labour Party, but have been smashed, have, 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 have almost disappeared. But in, in some cases have disappeared. Where the PDS in Italy, the socialists in France, the SPD in Germany, PASOK in, in, in Greece, these massive parties that, that, that frequent, that, that continuously, reliably got 40 to 50 percent of the vote at elections and, was, and, and, and were the representatives of the working class in those countries in Parliament have all but disappeared, have been re reduced to rumps, getting single figure election results in, uh, in some cases. And we cannot ignore the possibility that, uh, that the Labour Party could uh, perhaps be, you know, I'm not saying will be reduced to that level in the next year or, 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 or two years. Britain is a little bit different. We've always had a more, uh, a, 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 a more centralised focus on the one Labour Party. But we cannot, we cannot assume that Labour will come back from this and be seen as, uh, as the voice of Labour. And the warning of the loss of support in the traditional Labour heartlands particularly in the Midlands and the North, is, uh, is, uh, is something that we, that we ignore at our absolute peril. So in many ways... One minute I think, to go, Jared. Thank you, Dave. So in many ways, I think Tusk is analogous to the, uh, to, to, to the role that the Labour Representation Committee had to play back then. The, the LRC got 1.3% of the vote in the 1900 election, 42,000 votes, although they were concentrated in two seats that they, that they won. In 1906, they got 29 seats, 4.8% of the vote. But they had the TUC, the ILP, the, S the Social Democratic Federation, and the Fabians behind them. Imagine what we could do today. Imagine, even if just a few of the big trade unions came behind a new project, whether it's called Tusk or anything else, imagine what we could achieve today Tap it into that that uh, that that clear support for Corbyn's 2017 election manifesto, but without having to explain away the role of uh, of Labour councils in making cuts in the in the past. There is a huge danger, and I'll finish on uh, on this point. There's a huge danger that if we don't play that role, then we leave the terrain completely clear to opportunists and right wingers to come in. And, uh, and take the, uh, the anti-establishment vote. When you look at the rise of UKIP, for example, in 1992, they got 0.01% of the vote at the general election. By, by 10 years later, they were getting 1.5%. And in 2005, they got 2.2%. In 2010, 3.1%. And at that point, around 2010, the TUC were mobilising hundreds of thousands on the streets against austerity, but they handed that to the right. They, they gave that away. They gave it away industrially by selling out the pensions dispute. Unfortunately, in my in my view, they uh, they gave that position away, and of course they gave it away by telling people to rely on the Labour Party, wait for Labour, and uh, and so the initiative was handed uh, away. And of course, in 2015, UKIP then were able to get nearly 13 percent of the vote. At, uh, at the general uh, at the general election, we we could we there is there is a massive latent support there for a genuine party of the working class at the present time. And what we have to do is build our forces in every trade union. We have to go much broader than we are now. We have to ensure that the RMT is not isolated as the only union that seem to be associated with us. We need to build support groups in every union. And I would argue that building support for the idea of independent working class political representation must now be seen as one of the priorities for every socialist in every trade union in this country. And if we do that, then I think although we've got many forces ranged against us, whether that be the press, whether that be the Labour Party, whether it be the judiciary or whoever, we've got many forces ranged against us, but we have history behind us. We have the same historical conditions for the establishment of the Labour Party behind us now, and we have to grasp that now. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Jared. That's Jared Wood, from the, uh, who's a, a member of the National Executive Committee of the uh, RMT, who, as I say, was uh, 
the founder organization in January 2010 when Tusk itself was founded under the then uh, and, and now uh, regretfully late uh, General Secretary Bob, Bob Crow. Thanks very much, uh, Jared. Uh, our next uh, speaker uh, is Hannah Sell. Um, Hannah is the General Secretary of the, the Socialist Party, which was uh, also a founder organization uh, 11 years ago. So, uh, Hannah, your 10 minutes starts now. But you'll need to be unmuted. Who's going to unmute you? Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Now. That's it. Right. Um, uh, okay, well, thanks very much, Dave. And as Dave has just said, Tusk was founded in 2010 by the late great Bob Crow, then General Secretary of the RMT, the Socialist Party, and others. But this is the first Tusk conference since 2018 because in 2018, we agreed to suspend all electoral activity. And prior to that, the participating organizations in Tusk had unanimously agreed that we would not contest the 2017 general election, but would instead campaign for a Jeremy Corbyn victory in that election. But now in 2021, we are back in action and back in action at, in our view, a vital time. The COVID pandemic has driven home the crisis of British capitalism. Jared has already referred to this, but we have one of the worst death rates in the world. We have more than 6 million people on universal credit, 2 million facing destitution. I had a little personal glimpse of this the other day when I walked home to find a queue for the local food bank spreading 100 meters past my fast flat door as young people in Newham, it was mainly young people, queued up to get something to eat. And Newham, like every poor working class area in the country, has had not only terrible poverty as a result of the pandemic, but also the highest death rates. Millions of working class people are never going to forget or forgive what Johnson has made them suffer in the last year. And it is incredible that in that situation, Starmer's Labour are not ahead in the opinion polls. But why aren't they ahead in the opinion polls? Because they haven't offered any opposition. Unfortunately, Johnson was right when he said Marcus Rashford has given more opposition to his government than Starmer has uh, as the leader of the opposition. It was summed up by the farce at the start of this year where trade unionists in education said rightly that it wasn't safe for them to go and work in the schools in their thousands. And under pressure, Johnson was forced into a U-turn to take the action to shut the normal functioning of the schools. And yet even while leading Tory politicians were saying, yes, the schools should shut, Starmer was so desperate to have nothing to do with working class action, nothing to do with the trade unions, that he was still refusing to call for the schools to be shut. His every act, large and small, whether it's mainly actually backing the government's approach on COVID, or whipping Labour MPs not to vote against the spy cops bill, or failing to sign a letter to stop a Windrush deportation flight, all of his acts are designed to show that like Blair, he is a Labour leader who represents the interests of the millionaires, not the millions. And of course, the systematic annihilation of Corbynism, with the removal of the Labour whip from Jeremy Corbyn on completely spurious grounds, and the suspension and expulsion of many Labour Party members who have dared to support him. So we're in a situation where Starmer's Labour is not representing the interests of the working class. Back in 2015, when Jeremy was elected as Labour leader, it raised enormous hopes, including in the Socialist Party. We didn't think that his election transformed Labour into a workers' party because it was still clear that there was a big, powerful Blairite wing of the party who were determined to reclaim Labour for big business. But that's, and that's why we consistently put forward a programme to defeat the pro-capitalist right and to enable the transformation of the Labour Party. But of course, the opportunity that Corbyn's election represented was not realised. And in the wake of that defeat, it is inevitable 
that there are many people who were originally infused who now feel demoralized. Many who will draw the conclusion that we should turn away from electoral politics, that there's nothing that could be done. But in our view, that would be a serious mistake to take that road, because it would mean that we were leaving the working class with a choice between different brands of big business politics at a time of dire economic and social crisis. And actually, for all of our collective frustration about the defeat of Corbynism, we have to say that there are positive lessons to be learned from the experience of the last five years. There are a generation of young people who in both general elections overwhelmingly voted for Jeremy Corbyn's Labour. And, you know, in reality, in our view in the Socialist Party, Jeremy's manifestos were quite modest. We would want to go much further, nationalising the major corporations and banks that dominate the economy. But nonetheless, they are a generation of young people who in the main had previously never heard of socialism, never heard of nationalisation, and recognise that as a good thing as a result of Jeremy Corbyn's election manifestos, and are now looking, in many cases, for another place where they can find those ideas because they're not going to get them from Starmer's Labour. Let's also remember that back in 2017, we saw the biggest increase in the vote for any party in a single election since 1945. And that included more than a million UKIP voters who switched to Jeremy Corbyn's Labour because despite the bile and the attacks and the poison coming from the right wing press, that weighed less heavily with them than a manifesto that was for the many and not the few. And so they went and put a cross for Labour in the ballot box. Starmer thinks he is going to win Tory or Brexit party voters by cynically wrapping himself in the Union Jack. And of course, all he is doing is feeding the dangers of racism and nationalism. But 2017 gave a glimpse of how working class voters, including many who've previously voted to the right, can be won by the left if the left offers a programme in the interests of the working class. This May, we are going to see the largest ever number of local authority elections on, in England, plus parliamentary elections in Scotland and Wales, in a situation where eight out of 10 councils that provide social care are facing bankruptcy. And criminally, up until now, Labour councils have accepted they've got no choice but to implement the cuts that the Tory government demands. And we know that is not going to change under Starmer's rule. And yet this is at a time when the government has spent unprecedented amounts of money. They found a magic money tree. Last year, they spent three and a half times the annual spending proposed in the 2019 Labour Manifesto. Of course, the Tories are spending that money not in the interests of the working class, but to prop up their rotten system um, and to hand out buns to their mates. But it's never been clearer that if Labour councils were to stand up and fight and to refuse to implement Tory cuts, to demand more money from central government, they could force this endlessly U-turning bunch of Tories to retreat. But Starmer's not going to do that. And so unless we stand, working class people will face a choice of cutters with different coloured rosettes in the local elections. And the danger, of course, is to they vent their frustration by voting for the right. So in our view, it's vital that we stand in these elections. Let's be clear. In the Socialist Party, we think what is needed is a mass party of the working class with a socialist programme. And in our view, having failed to achieve that with Jeremy Corbyn as leader, Labour is not going to be transformed into such a party under Starmer's watch. But maybe there are some in the room who still hope that Labour can be transformed and are therefore hesitant about standing candidate elections. And we would say to you, the best way or one of the most effective ways we can put pressure on the Labour rant, right is to stand candidates against the worst cutters. That would be a very effective measure to take. And we would add, we're very proud of Tusk, but we do not have exaggerated ideas about what it represents. We do not claim that Tusk is the solution to the crisis of working class political representation. And we would be very happy if bigger forces were to step up. That's why in the Socialist Party, we put demands on the left trade union leaders. It's also why 
We've raised the idea, for example, that Jeremy Corbyn should stand for London mayor. If he was to do that, as Livingston did 21 years ago, then he could win, as Livingston did, and that would be far more effective at putting pressure on the Starmerites than, than politely campaigning inside the Labour Party. And if one minute to go. Okay, and if, as unfortunately Livingston did not, he was to campaign uh, for, on a fighting socialist programme, it would transform the situation not just in London, but internationally. But at the moment, there are not bigger forces fighting at the ballot box. So Tusk has a vital role to play. And our success, which we and we think we will have success, can act as a lever to speed up events. Tusk is what it says on the tin. It's a coalition of trade unionists and socialists. And we've always worked and continue to work on the basis of consensus. So for the local elections, as Clive will explain, we're putting forward a platform which we think is the minimum you need to sign up to to stand under the Tusk banner in the local elections. And the essence of the position is if you want to stand for Tusk, you have to agree that if elected, you will go into the council chamber and fight in the interests of working class people. But if you agree with that, if you agree not to vote for cuts or privatisation, then whether you're a worker striking against the council's fire and rehire policy, or a pensioners rights activist, or a Black Lives Matter campaigner, or a housing activist, you are welcome to stand under the Tusk banner to help you prosecute your struggle in the council chamber. There are comparisons with what Jared said about the history of the Labour Party, which at its foundations began on an extremely federal basis. So different organisations stood candidates and when they were elected, they agreed to come together to fight in workers' interests. Of course, as Jared intimated at the end of his contribution, in many senses, we're still at an earlier stage. At the beginning of Tusk, we didn't have any official trade union affiliation. Bob Crow and others were there as individuals from the RMT. The RMT's affiliation was then very welcome and is an enormous strength for Tusk. But in this period, we have to fight to get broader trade union support. We've already got more individual trade unionists on the steering committee, and that should be a step to fighting for affiliation. We've also got more socialist groups coming on board. Last sentences. We cannot say exactly how events are going to develop, but it is clear that compared to 11 years ago, in the wake of the financial crash, the economic, social and environmental crisis of capitalism is far more acute today and therefore so also is the need for socialism. At the same time, the experiences of the last decade mean there is a much wider layer of working class and young people who see the need for a left alternative at ballot box. And finally, the COVID crisis and its aftermath means working class people are facing some of the hardest battles we've faced in the last century. And if we fight without an electoral arm to our struggle, we're fighting with one arm tied behind our back. So in our view, for all those reasons, Tusk is essential, but also our achievements in the coming months could far out, 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 outstrip what we did in our previous efforts in the pre-Corbyn era. Thanks very much, uh, Hannah. Uh, another excellent uh, contribution following Jared's. And we have two more um, platform uh, contributions from the component parts of the steering committee. Hannah, uh, as general secretary of the Socialist Party, has just spoken. Um, and if you've just joined us, then the first speaker was Jared Wood, who is a national executive committee member of the Transport Union, the RMT, both uh, organisations were present uh, at the beginning of, uh, of Tusk, as, as they've explained. Our next speaker is Pete McLaren. Um, Pete, for uh, quite some time, has uh, represented the uh, individual members, the, the, the unaligned socialists uh, within uh, uh, Tusk. And uh, in recent days, uh, Pete has been uh, re-elected to the uh, National uh, uh, Steering Committee for another term. So uh, 10 minutes now from Pete McLaren. Thanks, Dave. Comrades, sisters and brothers, um, thanks very much for, for being here today. For joining us in these strange situation of having a Zoom conference. It's certainly the first one I've ever attended. Um, but anyway, it, it's, it's great to, to have you on board. I've represented independent socialists, individual members on the Tusk National Steering Committee for 10 years now, virtually since the inception of Tusk, and in fact, since 
independent socialists were represented on Tusk. And that, that was a, that's a massive first. I've been involved in, I think, every single left unity type project over the last 30 or 40 years since many of us were expelled from the Labour Party for supporting Dave and, and two or three other decent socialists back in, in the 1980s. And um, none of those projects gave actual space for the representation of independence, independent socialists until Tusk agreed to do so 10 years ago. And, and I'm delighted about that development. I've always been committed to unity on the left, and I think it's a vital part of any process in moving towards the new workers' party that both Jared and Hannah have so correctly talked about. And I do seriously believe that Tusk is a stepping stone towards that project. I, I don't, I, like Hannah, I accept it is not the finished article, but it's made tremendous, process, tremendous strides in, in those 10 years. Three main points I want to, to, to address during my, my 10 minutes. The importance of the core policies I want to briefly mention, clearly that's not my brief, but I do want to mention them. I want to talk about the significance of local organization within Tusk. And I want to explain why I feel that Tusk has a unique opportunity right now to be building in the way that both Hannah and Jared have, have already outlined. The core policies, as has been explained, are the minimum that we expect all our candidates to stand by. It's the 100% we can all unite around. They are absolutely crucial and they bind us together. There are eight of them as bullet points at present. You may change that today, conference. They are not a manifesto that needs to be made absolutely clear. A manifesto is a broad range of policies and of course, Tusk does have a local and national manifesto also, which needs some updating, I, I hasten to add, because it's some time since we used particularly the, the national one. But these are the key points that bind us together. They spell out how councillors could oppose cuts and privatisation. We added a new one in November that I moved myself, and so I want to address that briefly. That was to fight for united working class struggle against racism and all forms of, of oppression. And I was delighted that the steering committee unanimously has adopted that as one of our core policies that all our candidates must sign up to. It must become an automatic part of our campaigning to relate to those suffering specific oppressions. Women's rights groups, gay groups, black groups, all groups of people who are suffering persecution or oppression today. Black Lives Matter have made a tremendous contribution to the fight against racism. And I'm delighted that in my local area of rugby, we were able to work closely with our comrades in the Black Lives Matter movement, supporting their protests and working with them to uh, produce material for the local media. And I was very proud to present an article to one of our local uh, uh, newspapers that printed the article in full with photographs taken by comrades within the Black Lives Matter movement in rugby jointly together and in, in partnership. And that comrades to me has always been the way forward, which is why we need to organize locally as well as nationally, which brings me on to my second point. I'm delighted to say that local Tusk groups are now emerging at a fairly fast rate. I say that particularly because my other role within Tusk, the other hat I have on, is to be its local group development officer. And I'm delighted at the promising signs that are being shown. Local groups, local Tusk branches, give the individual member an opportunity to have a say in national policy. It's where individual members can have their greatest say. I believe it's important that such local Tusk groups are permanent. They are not just established for the purpose of a particular election and then put to bed again. Now that isn't easy. We have to recognize that. Where there is a strong local party already in existence in an area, they will not want to duplicate their work. And that is something that we need to address in areas where particularly the Socialist Party is in the ascendancy. And I can I take my hat off today publicly to the work the Socialist Party has done, both in setting up Tusk in the first place and in maintaining it and then helping to relaunch it in motion from Tusk 
which I'm surprised Hannah didn't refer to, that actually has led indirectly to today's conference. And that is magnificent. But I understand why Socialist Party comrades may find it difficult to undertake the, the job of two groups. And that's something that we need to sensibly talk through over the coming months. And I do believe that independent socialists have a role to play here and can be far more proactive in being fo the focal point within their local areas. It's important, comrades, that we build a profile within the media, both nationally and also locally. And again, a permanent Tusk group can do that to the extent that the media come to the local Tusk group rather than the Tusk group going to them. And in rugby, where we've been established for 11 years now, we have actually got to that process where because Labour is so moribund, so useless and so ineffective, the local media come to us for comments on budgets or whatever it happens to be nationally or locally. And that's the stage we want Tusk to get at, or certainly I want Tusk to get at, and I'm sure that view is shared by, by others up and down the country. And I believe that we can achieve that. I really do. Moving on then to, to my final point. I believe that Tusk does provide a unique opportunity at this moment in time. We've already heard about Labour's lurch to the right. I, I couldn't believe it the other Sunday to be told, I wouldn't have read it myself, that Sir Keir Starmer had chosen the Mail on Sunday of all papers, the hate mail, to make his first major policy speech. And three things in particular came out of that. One was that Labour had to connect with people who are, I quote, proud to be British. And we all know what that actually means in reality. Secondly, he said, we must tackle government waste. What he means by that is cuts, another agenda for cuts. And then he went on to say, what to me means is, 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 is pandering to racism, that Labour must connect with people who want stringent immigration controls. Those were his words, stringent immigration controls. We all know what that means. That is racism. Immigration controls are racist by nature. So we've got Labour completely moribund and increasing numbers of left-wingers within the Labour Party, many who joined because of, of Jeremy, now wanting to leave. They need somewhere to go to. That puts us in a unique position. Secondly, the post-pandemic politics are going to be severe, as has already been pointed out. It will be our class that the Tories will come to for the 284 billion that had already been spent on COVID measures up until last November. It'll come from our class. There have already been pay cuts. Furlough itself is a pay cut of 20%, of course. Unemployment is rising rapidly towards the two and a half million that the government itself predicts it will be by the summer. Universal credit, those who are on it, and, and we've piloted that dreadful benefit in rugby, is simply making more and more people being forced to, to use food banks and to worry about their rent situations. That situation is going to get worse, comrades, and there needs to be an alternative to rotten labour. And then my final aspect of why unique Tusk provides that unique opportunity is that Tusk has a federal structure, which I believe sincerely can help it to grow. I wasn't a great believer in federalism within socialist politics until I could see how it was developing within Tusk. And comrades, it's what keeps us all together from a vast variety of backgrounds. What you sign up to is the 100%, the core policies that we're discussing now today. You then take out the bits you want to from the broader Tusk programme. It's how the Labour Party developed historically, as Jared has already pointed out. The federal structure can be used where the one member, one vote system no longer is of use. Of course, individual votes are crucial on certain policy issues and always have been and always will be, but they can be abused as we know historically, those of us who've been members of the original Socialist Alliance can write chapter about that. So comrades, I do believe that the federal structure enables us to move forward at a pace that everyone is prepared to move with. And so comrades, in conclusion, I do believe that Tusk is a stepping stone towards a new mass workers party, a new mass socialist party. 
we can unite around that 100% that we all agree on. And we can develop Tusk through an expanded steering committee, through permanent local groups, and through expansion of individual membership. Thank you, comrades. Thanks very much, uh, Pete. Um, third excellent uh, contribution we've had uh, this morning. And as Pete mentioned during his uh, contribution, uh, if you've had a launch meeting in your area, or if you've got one planned, uh, and I think there's about 10 or a dozen um, up on the website that are coming up in the rest of this, uh, this month in different areas, uh, please get in touch with the details of how your local group is organised and who the coordinator is. You can contact me and I'll put you in touch with Pete because Pete's uh, maintaining that uh, information. Um, our final platform uh, uh, speaker uh, for the first part of the conference um, is going to be Dave Roberts. Uh, Dave is a, a director of Resist, the uh, movement for a people's uh, party. In fact, on the uh, uh, Interim Organisational uh, Committee of uh, Resist, and we invite uh, Dave to address conference now. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good morning, comrades, brothers and sisters. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's always difficult going uh, forth dibs, uh, Tana and Charlie, because <laughs> all of the central, the central points have already been made by the previous speakers, and they've all been made excellently made. And I agree with 99.9%, which is not a bad uh, percentage, really. Um, it's probably worth, as we are the new kids on the block uh, in terms of Tusk, uh, it's probably worth just um, revisiting, you know, where we've come from, what we're about, and why we're prepared to work as part of Tusk um, to mount a very, very important, as, a, as has already been said, a very, very important electoral challenge as part of building resistance to the crisis that's coming down the line very, very rapidly and is going to impoverish large swathes of the working class in Britain and, and of course, internationally. Um, I say we're the um, uh, new kids on the block, but um, uh, we're quite an interesting, uh, our membership is made up of people who've come from, you know, right across the political spectrum uh, and have come from opposite directions. If I talk about me and uh, Chris Williamson, for example, Chris, classic left Labour MP, uh, good working class voice for, for his constituency in North Derbyshire, spent 45 years building the Labour Party, uh, fighting for the Labour Party, um, representing it at national and, you know, ministerial level. Um, me uh, from, you know, I've, you know, we're roughly the same age, but I've spent 45 years opposing the Labour Party, fighting against it, standing against it for, for a whole um, range of reasons, not least the, um, the fact that uh, I very early on in my political career arrived at the point that the Labour Party would never ever be able under capitalism in Britain deliver uh, the socialism that we needed. Um, I wanted to go back to some of the points that Jared made. I'm rap rapidly ripping up the speech I was going to make because all the points have already been made. Um, Jared's right in terms of that federal, early federal structure of the Labour Party, of course, and, and its development. But um, we're faced with, there's a mantra, isn't there, that's going uh, around the media all the time. And the mantra is, oh, unprecedented times. You know, we've never been here before. And that's the mantra that's usually pushed out by the media in order to explain the you know, latest failure of the Tories Tory government to deal with the pandemic crisis and the economic fallout from it. You know, well, we have been here before. You know, we are we're here before time and time again. Really, as capitalism's uh, slumped and uh, boomed and then slumped again. Um, if you just look at the the hundred years, and I know Jared went back. Jared went back a hundred years. If you look at the hundred years, look at the two thousand and fifteen to two thousand and twenty for you know what was happening in the world during those years, and look at the last five years now 100 years. I mean, the parallels are just um, uh, incredible, really, uh, except for one important one. During that period, of course, mass uh, discontent, rising uh, campaigns for socialism, uh, organised uh, trade union, 
trade union movements coming together to form and push for political representation and you know the development of the Labour Party. But also, you know, it's it's the year of degradation of the World War, the slaughter of World War One. It's the period of the R Russian Revolution. It's the period of the 1916 uprising. It's the period here in Britain um, of the revolutionary developments on Clyde's side led by uh, John McLean. Um, but equally, it, it, it's a period where the establishment uh, clearly set about trying to defeat that in a variety of ways. Um, it tried to defeat it, obviously, with the uh, Soviet, they managed to defeat the German Revolution, they failed to defeat the Soviet Revolution, but, you know, 22 Western armies invaded the Soviet Union to try and crush those developments. We saw what happened to the brave uh, uprising in, in 1916, and of course, internally, the uh, strikes and the revolutionary developments in, in Scotland were, were eventually dissipated and, uh, and uh, dealt with. But the establishment re recouped from all of those dangers to itself, the British capitalist class recouped. And part of that recoupment, I'm convinced, was always about allowing the Labour Party, allowing the Labour Party to be formed, allowing uh, reform to offer reform, rather than allow the working class to take a revolutionary road. And if you look at the last five years, then we're also seeing um, you know, five years into austerity, rising tides of discontent, rising tides of militancy um, from, from the working class, I think, um, nationally and internationally, not represented through the Labour Party, not represented through the trade union movement, but represented through mass campaign groups, whether it's Black Lives Matter or Extinction Rebellion, uh, protests around the world in, in, in various countries. Um, but this time round, of course, what we're seeing vis-a-vis -vis the history of the Labour Party is that I think the establishment, you know, having lost control of the Labour Party as a vehicle for offering the working class social reform and the illusion of a parliamentary route to so real socialism, offering them that, to actually uh, having lost control to close down the Labour Party and destroy it as uh, a force within the traditional working class. Um, and I think that's what the, the, the uh, destruction of the Corbyn project, that's what um, uh, we've been faced with uh, recently. Um, it's not, you know, we also need to have an analysis that looks at Corbyn and Corbynism as part of the problem rather than, you know, the, the solution. It's not, you know, uh, I know that we'll be concentrating on Keir Starmer's Labour and, the, and the, uh, the Tory government as the problem, but there were clearly mistakes. Corbynism at itself, you know, to a large extent. Um, you know, once, once you've abandoned and thrown under the bus people like Ken Livingstone and Jackie Walker and, of course, Chris Williamson, um, then you really have surrendered the Corbyn project um, at that point um, because these were your biggest supporters. These were your frontline supporters and you abandoned them, caving into the uh, pressure of the establishment and the, the vilification campaign. Well, you know, that needs to be taken on board, I think, as, as we talk about what is the future of the Labour Party? What is the potential of the Labour Party uh, uh, left to stay in the Labour Party and transform it? You know, is it dead? Is it the end of the road for the Labour Party? Do we need to remake the Labour Party of the 1920s? You know, do we need to move forward into something else? Now, people have already alluded to the fact. I, you know, I was, Corbyn was the sort of, what was called the accident, accidental leader of the Labour Party historically. Um, I was an accidental member in the sense that um, I was on holiday at the time when I, when I emailed pinged and said, you know, uh, if you join, if you send us three quid and join as a registered supporter of the Labour Party, you can vote for Corbyn. And almost, you know, I thought, well, it's like, it's like taking a, a punt on the Grand National, isn't it? You know, everyone likes to back the outsider. Um, so I spent my three quid and I joined and I put the vote in for Corbyn and lo and behold, he wins. Um, then, of course, uh, the right wing, as part of their uh, attempt to undermine him and the whole Corbyn project, 
uh, and the left, you know, insisted that he do it all over again. And for people like me who are on the edge, just as registered supporters, we were told, oh, we've got to stop, knock that three pound a go uh, bet on the, what's it, you're going to have to pay full membership. And of course, when you realise that this campaign is really getting up the nose of the right wing of the, the Labour Party and the establishment, then of course you pay your 28 quid, you take your, and in you go. Um, I eventually ended up the chair of my local Labour Party because the uh, right wing had tried to destroy it as a force to abandon it as it or it started orientating itself around the late the Corbyn project, much to their, uh, um, you know, alarm. And of course, started offering support to the good socialists in the party like Chris Williamson. Um, I remember One my, minute, Dave. Okay, I remember my first meeting and having uh, explained that um, I'd spent my entire political career campaigning against the Labour Party, I realised that there was something else happening in the Labour Party at that meeting because I was voted in unanimously, having you know camp yeah, explained who I was and why I'd, I'd you know campaigned against the Labour Party all my political life. Clearly, a movement. The three hundred thousand who joined are the people that we need now to get regrouped, organised to build a new grassroots democratic movement to develop socialism in Britain. The, um, you know, we shouldn't have the arrogance to think any one of us is gonna do it, any one of us is gonna lead it. We need to get people together. We need to be fighting a united fight, comrades. There's an old adage, isn't there? We may be marching uh, separately, but we need at this point historically to be striking together if we've got a chance of defeating the austerity and the, the crisis politics that are coming uh, down the line towards us. I'll leave it there, comrades. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, that was Dave Roberts, who is uh, part of the interim organising uh, committee of Resist the Movement for a People's Party. Uh, and Dave uh, is the fourth excellent uh, speech we've had this morning to set the political background to today's uh, conference and, and for our work in the weeks uh, ahead. Now, before I take uh, floor speakers and, and just to uh, give the first two uh, whose names have come out the hat to get themselves uh, ready, two key areas in the May elections, um, I'm going to take Nancy Taff, uh, from London and uh, Jim McFarlane, who is a member of Unison uh, in Dundee. But before I take those two speakers, the final uh, platform speaker will be uh, Clive Heemskirk. Clive is the national agent of, uh, of Tusk, responsible for keeping us uh, legal and uh, sorted out with the Electoral Commission, amongst uh, other things. But what his job this morning to do uh, is to explain the draft core policy document um, for the May. Uh, local elections. Now there's a link to that document uh, in the chat and for those of you who are watching uh, uh, this conference after the conference is finished, if you go to www.tusk.org.uk you'll find uh, that document on our website. So uh, Clive would you like to introduce the draft core policy document? Thank you Dave and thanks to the other speakers as well. Um, as Dave has said my job um, at this meeting, at this, uh, at this point in the meeting, is to introduce the Tusk Core Policies Platform, which the Tusk Steering Committee is proposing for the local elections in May. These are eight bullet points, which are on page four of the conference agenda document, and they are not an exhaustive list of policies defining what Tusk stands for. They're not a national manifesto in that sense of the word. Instead, what the local elections core platform is, are the minimum commitments anybody who wants to stand under, under the Tusk umbrella has to make in order to become a Tusk candidate in this year's elections in May. Now, under election law in Britain, you can only appear on the ballot paper either as a candidate of a, of a registered political party like Tusk or as independent. And we have to be clear that appearing as independent doesn't identify where you stand. Are you for austerity or against it? Are you with the working class against the 1%, the capitalist elite, or not? Let's not forget when the eight Blairites MPs 
left the Labour Party to try and sabotage Jeremy Corbyn's leadership early in 2019 and joined up with a group of Tories in Parliament. They called themselves the Independent Group, hiding the, um, whose interests they were really serving with that label. So independent doesn't cut it. But appearing on the ballot paper with trade unionist and socialist coalition next to your name and the bold Tusk Against Cuts emblem that you're allowed to use on the ballot paper makes it absolutely clear that you stand as part of the working class movement resisting austerity and providing an alternative to the capitalist system. Now Tusk, as other speakers have said, is a coalition of organisations and individuals. And the core policies platform is the bottom line of what unites Tusk candidates. To put it simply, if somebody is not prepared to commit to going into the town hall and voting for the council to refuse to implement austerity politics, they cannot be a Tusk candidate. That, that's the role of the eight core policy bullet points. It's the bottom line in that sense for what it, uh, it means to be a Tusk candidate. Now, opposing austerity politics includes taking a stand against divide and rule tactics that the pro-capitalist politicians use to try and push through their policies against our interests and in the interests of the elites. That's why we have included, as Pete McLaren has alluded to in the bullet points, alongside explicit commitments to oppose all cuts, all closures and privatizations, the, the, the commitment to fight for united working class struggle against racism and all forms of oppression, because we see defending workers' unity as a vital part of the struggle against austerity. But the question of questions that is posed by the platform, the key dividing line in that sense, is can councillors really vote to refuse to implement cuts to council jobs, workers' conditions and local public services? And the simple answer to that is yes, they can. That's not to say, as other speakers have said, Jared, for example, in his opening comments, that councillors have not faced a decade of austerity, a decade of um, uh, uh, policies from the Tory government to um, try and curb um, uh, local spending and are not facing new cuts. They are. As the Tories look for new ways to make working class people pay for the COVID crisis, local councils and the services that they provide will be in the front line. The government funding settlements for councils for this year, the coming year, will be debated in Parliament on Tuesday. And the figures in that document show that for this financial year, councils in England will have 30% less from central government in funding than they got six years ago in 2015. So they are facing cuts. They are facing a crisis of funding. But we have to be clear that councils still have enormous powers not to make cuts, to spend what is necessary on local services and demand that central government meets the bill. Councils have powers. In the exact words of the 2007 Local Government Localism Act, they have powers to do anything apart from that which is specifically prohibited. In other words, they don't need permission to introduce free school meals or breakfast clubs for school students, to end zero hour contracts and unpaid travel time for home care workers, to introduce local educational maintenance allowances for 16 to 17 year olds in education, to use their powers, as the platform says, to build eco-friendly, genuinely affordable council homes to help meet the housing crisis and so on. And we have produced a document that's also on the Tusk website on policies that were promised just uh, 13 months ago in Labour's 2019 general election, that councils have the power to implement now, to introduce them now. They don't need new legislation. They've got the powers to implement them now if they have the will to fight for the needs of people, working class people in their local community. To put it another way, if the 122 um, or, or 120 or so Labour led councils in Britain were combined together into a separate country, 
Labour Council land, let's call it that, they would have greater spending power than the state budgets of 16 countries in the EU, including, for example, Portugal. So let's imagine for a minute, if this was a meeting of trade unionists, of working class community campaigners and socialists sitting in Portugal, or zooming in, in Portugal, with control of the state budget there, would we really sit here and say, there's nothing we can do but implement austerity? Of course not. And we should have the same approach to councils, including and above all, Labour councils, Labour controlled councils in, uh, 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 across Britain. Now, there are technical arguments that we've uh, uh, detailed and gone into elsewhere in Tusk material. And by the way, applied them where we've had in the past Tusk councillors in different councils, uh, uh, um, only a handful, one or two places, uh, uh, one or two councillors, but we've had Tusk councillors. We've moved these arguments in the council chamber. We produced the technical arguments showing how councils could use their powers to resist austerity and improve the conditions of the working class in their areas. But in the core policies, in the core policy platform, we've only summarized that in the final bullet points, which calls for councils to refuse to implement cuts and set needs budgets. And we've done that because we, it's not a, a technical question. That's the point really, um, it relates to what the role of the um, the core policies is it's not a technical question that councils can defy the government it's a matter of political will and that's what the core policies represent they are not a mass of policy detail um, and they can uh, policy details can be supplemented by individuals in their election material but they are a, a pledge card that our candidates will fight to the end to defend the working class in their area and nationally now, under Jeremy Corbyn, as has been said, Labour was two parties in one, with those looking to the ideas of socialism wanting to fight austerity, and on the other hand, including, unfortunately, the majority of Labour councillors, and not all Labour councillors, we know there are some Labour councillors or ex-Labour councillors here today who have taken the step to uh, uh, um, link up and discuss with Tusk, but um, uh, the majority of Labour councillors who saw no further, can see no further than capitalism and its demands, who are not prepared to resist austerity and opposed Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. And now it's clear that that wing, that capitalist wing has won control. They've taken back control of the Labour Party. And that's why, as other speakers have said, Tusk is resuming standing candidates again in the elections um, starting in May. And the core policy platform, which I'm now formally moving, it is the pledge that our candidates make that we don't accept that there is no alternative to austerity. We don't accept the logic of capitalism that demands a tax on the working class to pay for the COVID crisis and the crisis of its system, and that we will fight for the working class all the way. That's what the core policies represent. That pledge, they aren't the, they're not the massive detail, but the pledge that we will fight for the interests of the working class in the council chambers. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Clive, not least for coming in under 10 minutes uh, in terms of the contribution. That's, uh, that's excellent. Well, that's the um, five uh, introductory uh, platform uh, speakers, four from the component uh, 